In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Today we prepare ourselves for the end of this church calendar year and we make ready for the new year that is at hand. Next week we will celebrate Christ the King Sunday when we truly recognize that the one that we await, the one that we prepare for in Advent that follows after, is Christ the King, the one who is expected to set all to rights according to the prophets of old and the one who has redeemed us in his saving work on the cross. But we await Jesus, of course, in his second coming. As Advent approaches and as we gather ourselves together, getting ready for Christmas to celebrate Jesus' first coming as he was born into our midst and lived a life as one of us, we remember that Jesus is promised to come again. And when he returns, he will be returning to end the age, to usher in the new era of God. And it will be the end of life as we know it and as we have known it for all time that we can remember as humans. And it is when the heavenly host will return to earth, there will be a form of separation for those who are judged as one sort and those who are judged as another. There will be a purification that happens and then we will enter into the eternity that is promised. Now, if your heart isn't beating a little bit faster after we've just noted all of those things that we're waiting for in Scripture, and if you don't get a bit of a rush when reading uh, some of the apocalyptic Scriptures in Revelation, if you've had a go at doing that, then you've got a better nerve than I have. Because I tell you, thinking about the end of the world as we know it, and the way that Scripture describes these events it sounds like a complete upheaval that would certainly make me feel a little fearful and so perhaps we can see a little bit of the perspective of that poor worthless slave in the gospel passage this morning we hear of how this owner of slaves this person of of worth has been uh, away for a time and during that time had entrusted the people who he had counted on to make good his investments. And we hear how some of those people did a really good job and others didn't do such a good job. And in finding out that this slave who he had entrusted with just one talent, maybe he didn't have a lot of faith in this particular slave to begin with because he was only given one knowing that the others had doubled the money that was left to them. This owner of slaves is extremely angry and disappointed. And I think what angers him, and we can see from the scholarship in this passage, that it's not so much that there wasn't a return on the investment, but rather that this slave was seen as lazy and had been fearful in not acting in the meantime until the master returned. So it sounds like a little bit of a harsh kind of um, response from this owner. This person then says, okay, right, slave, you're having your talent taken off of you and you are going to be cast out. You are not entering into the pleasure of your master as the others and you no longer have a place in my household. Thinking about the end of the age and perhaps the way that Jesus was using this parable to inspire the people listening to it not to sit back in fear in the meantime as we await Jesus' return, but rather to make good the investment and the trust that we have been given to try and multiply the things that Jesus has entrusted us with. Now, if we think about that, we have been entrusted as the church, as Christians, with the word of God. We've been entrusted to proclaim this word, this good news, so that others might too come to live in the light with us and also to await Jesus' return. So if that's the case, then we can think about our responsibility and what we've been entrusted with as the way that we then share the word of God in the world And that we are encouraged by our Lord today through this gospel passage not to sit idly back in fear as I myself have acknowledged I'd quite like to do when thinking about end times. It's overwhelming. It's quite scary. But we're not to let that get in the way 
because we have been entrusted with a lot of responsibility in building up the kingdom of God so that when the time comes for that separation, for that judgment, for when Jesus returns as king to rule on earth and to set all to rights, that there is greater amount of justice present at that time, that there are more people awaiting Jesus' return who are ready, in a sense, even if they're not quite ready, but still trying to be ready, making the effort to be ready with us to await Jesus' return. So thinking about that, we now have an amazing encouragement from St. Paul's letter to the Thessalonians this morning. He writes about us being children of the day. And this day is filled with light and it's filled with that justice, humility and all the things that we are entrusted to behave like and with. He writes to reassure us that we don't need to know the exact chronological time that Jesus returns. At the very beginning of this passage, he acknowledges that the Thessalonians are doing well because they're not getting hung up on those details about the end times. There were many and still are many Christian traditions who really try and put stock into actually adding it up and saying, oh, the end time is going to happen in, example, 2012 or at the close of the millennium, 2000. But St. Paul writes saying, actually, that's not important. You don't need to do the maths. Phew. What you need to be doing is living authentically as you've been called to live. And that means living in community with one another and building one another up. I particularly love that phrase, building one another up in faith with encouragement. But it also is about what we then put out into the wider community. Because if we as Christians project fearfulness at Jesus' return, then what will that say to those that we're trying to share the good news with and bring to relationship with God? So instead, we must be realistic about what it is we've been entrusted with and be ready to respond, trusting and working on our relationship with God in the here and now, and what we've been called to do. Now, the good news is that in our psalm, we're reminded that God doesn't just leave us to do this all by ourselves. It is not completely on our human merit that these things can be achieved. But it is through the aid and help of God that we will be built up by one another in relationship but also that we will be spiritually enabled for this task. Phew, that's a relief. And it's only in our choosing and in our inner work that we do with God that we will truly be able to build ourselves up individually with that relationship, but also build up the church corporately together so that we are united in this mission to be children of light, to be light bringers to others, to live in the day, to keep awake and be sober and ready for Jesus in a way that we are not projecting fear, but rather confidence in what God has promised for us. Now, the last little thought for this morning, we're just going to delve very briefly into the Old Testament passage. And this is quite an exciting passage because we see how Deborah, this prophetess in the Old Testament period, is in a sense living as a child of light for her people. We hear of how the warriors, those who were entrusted to be strong in their capacity as ones that fight for Israel and fight for being the light of the nations, They've lost their way. They've gone to sleep. They're allowing the darkness and the fear to get hold of them as they face their enemies, and they've lost their trust in God. But Deborah is demonstrating perhaps our role in any sort of spiritual warfare, but also in the justice and advocacy that we're called to in this life, in that she trusts that God will prevail. It's not on her own merit. It's not on the merit of the warriors. But she knows that if she puts herself in the circumstances where God is enabled to work and that she's being part of that, they will not lose. They will triumph over all the darkness that they face. 
There's also a little quip in a moment where she does recognize in conversation with Balak that, okay, you guys have lost your trust in God. I haven't, a female prophetess. And unfortunately for you, the glory that you're seeking isn't going to come to you in this because you've asked that I come along. It's going to go to me and not actually to me, but actually to God, the one who you've lost trust in. So I like that little moment. There's a bit of cheekiness there from Deborah, I think. So wrapping all of that up, as we await Jesus, both in the first coming at Christmas, as we celebrate his birth amongst us, his dwelling with us, his experience of life in its fullness, the same experience that we get to have with ups and downs, that we too are also waiting for Jesus' second coming, that return at the end of the age when all will be set to rights, when he will reign as king on earth and God will have this wonderful new creation for us to be part of. We're not to be fearful of that time, even though it will be an enormous upheaval, but rather as we wait, we are to get busy, not to fall asleep, but to make sure that we are living as children of the light so that those around us might come to light as well and wait with us. And we will be enabled in this mission, this mission that we have been given by Jesus, by the Holy Spirit. If only we open ourselves up, do the inner work that we are called to do and allow God to work through us. Amen. <laughs>